All right, it is 9.31. I would say let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> uh, let me just restate uh, what I was covering before in case you weren't joining uh, and in case you hadn't joined yet. Uh, so this is the November 2023 PowerShell Community Call. Uh, this is an open community. Everyone is welcome. And for anybody who's joining us for the first time today, thank you for joining us. Uh, and we look forward to a really great discussion. This meeting is recorded uh, and all the recordings of the past series of meetings are available on the uh, YouTube channel, which is linked there in the chat. Also, please remember our code of conduct and our contrib and the, the guidance provided in our contribution guide, a contributing document. Um, so if you haven't before, now's a good time to go take a quick look at our code of conduct and how to be an effective contributor to the community. And finally, the very last link that you'll see there is the GitHub discussion, which contains our agenda for today, uh, which I happen to have open in front of me. So let's go ahead and get right to it, because as you can see on the agenda, we have a lot to cover. Uh, we wanted to kick things off talking about the GitHub bot discussion. And for anybody who might be joining the call without context uh, for that, I wanted to explain uh, what it is and then open the floor for feedback. So essentially, uh, we, we, over the past couple of months, we've been looking at the PowerShell open source project and trying to look at ways that we can improve. And we collectively decided that the issue list has grown to a point where it's uh, not practical to manage or, or just generally unmanageable. And we just wanted to think about the issue list more as a stream of things that are incoming and outgoing in real time and not just a list that's continuing to grow. So we started looking at uh, well, and essentially one. I'll expand on that one one bit more, which is when an issue comes in, we want to be able to act on it. It should get triaged usually by a working group, and then it should either we we should agree to act on it or we should close it uh, with comments out of respect for the author who put their time into submitting the issue. We shouldn't just leave it open for for long long periods of time. And many of the issues that were in the list were actually more than a year old. Some of them were quite old, in fact, uh, which is which is not being a good steward of the project. And so, uh, and that actually offers an opportunity where if an issue gets closed, the author can go add additional context to the issue and submit it to be re-triaged. That's kind of a concept that we wanted to encourage is let's not just have these things hanging out there for a long time. Uh, if for some reason it's not being worked on, then maybe we need to get more information and make a new decision. And so we went out and observed a bunch of other projects across GitHub, including uh, projects like AZ CLI and AZ PowerShell, and concluded that using automation, uh, which obviously is a core tenet of the way we look at the world anyway, has been a common approach for a lot of these large, large scale projects. Uh, we did kind of acknowledge that setting a rolling time scale will impact older issues, which means uh, as we're thinking about this as OK, the, the, the bot basically works on comments and labels and provides automation based on those patterns. And uh, we were thinking about it as uh, an issue really should be handled within six months and handled can mean that we decide to do something about it and fix it or, or take on a new feature. Or it can mean that we just are transparent and provide feedback that that this we have to have the courage to say no we're not going to be able to work on that so we should respectfully communicate that back to the author but that rolling time scale means well what do we do with the issues that are already in the list that are older than six months and as a consequence of that rolling time scale, you have to go close them. It's not really what we wanted, but it does allow the authors of those issues to then go add new content, reopen them, get them re-triaged, and then for things that no longer apply, they can remain closed is the way we were thinking about it. Uh, we've had a lot of feedback uh, over the past week about the results of that early bulk closure that gets us into that rolling time scale. Uh, as a result of that, the changes we've made so far, uh, the bot originally was whenever it first published onto an issue and was saying, here's a seven day notification that if there's no further activity, this issue will be closed. It was uh, posting that message twice, which meant a lot of people were getting 
to email notifications when that seven day window started. Uh, so that has been fixed and going forward, only one comment will go in about the seven day notification as it approaches the six, the end of the six month window. Uh, and then also we've revised the text. This change hasn't gone in, uh, in, in place yet, but uh, just last night in the committee meeting, we went through and created a new text both for the seven day notification and for the closure notification that we felt uh, provided a little bit more context about the intention of why that activity is happening and then exactly what to do either to keep it open or uh, after it has been closed if you would like to reopen it or if you're not the author but you feel strongly that it should be reopened uh, how you can go about that so with that let's open the floor for discussion uh, i will ask because we do have a lot on the agenda uh, that if the discussion is going to go past about 945, then we should schedule a dedicated meeting in January to focus specifically on this topic. Uh, but let's first open this floor and, and have about a 10 minute conversation and, and just think in depth about uh, the, the use of automation to manage the issue lists. Um, you're, you're welcome to provide critical feedback as well. Uh, uh, critical feedback meaning that you know if, if you uh, feel strongly that this isn't the right approach, I'm happy to hear that. Um, or if you feel like we should make changes to improve upon this, we're certainly happy to hear that as well. Hey, Michael, can I just add a, a few things first? Certainly, yeah. So so one of the things, uh, I think there's two points of feedback um, that were important. And one of the things um, that we did talk about as a committee that we couldn't enact is really to, to leverage reactions, right? Um, the, basically the bot that we're leveraging has no way to query reactions. Reactions meaning like thumbs up, thumbs down, stuff like that. Um, so I think for now, what we decided is we're going to have a, kind of like a manual process that we can empower the working groups such that we have a new label simply called keep open. And, you know, if a working group notices that an issue has a lot of activity, not activity, but a lot of reactions, which doesn't trigger um, or reset the bot, um, then they can put that label on there along with other labels like, you know, the particular working group that probably should uh, be part of that discussion or at least review what to do with it. Um, in that case, the bot won't close those, right? So anything with the keep open will just be open indefinitely until someone takes action. So that was um, something new that we're going to do until we can get um, actual bot or automated um, tools around that. The other thing is uh, we recognize that one mistake we made is that, uh, you know, if an issue was never triaged, we uh, we probably should not have just auto closed. It's too late now to do that. So I think going forward, we were also uh, fixing the bot so that if it's never been triaged, I mean, no person has made some call on that issue, then that'll be also be left open, right? Um, so at least with those two minor things, hopefully things will be better going forward. Uh, yes, Justin, if you want to offer that, then by all means, uh, I'll spend time reviewing it, re referring to a GitHub action. I know that the um, the GraphQL query that GitHub supports, supports getting stuff like not only reactions, but also people who may have um, what is it? Not subscribe, but I've, Mike, what's the term I'm looking for? Yeah, so that you can sign up for, you can subscribe to notifications, meaning you want to get email whenever any activity happens in the issue, but you can also submit a reaction, which let you choose, lets you choose from a list of emojis. And I think we should probably just have a dedicated issue to collect feedback on how to approach this and kind of see like which, which do people prefer? Or do they want us to actually summarize both? And uh, we can figure that out later <laughs> not on the call yeah. i think <laughs> the, the important thing here right is like when when there's an issue someone had open and yes we recognize it's important to that person but we don't see any activity we don't see any reactions it's hard to really figure out like what is really the priority of that amongst all the other thousands of issues that have been open right so we have to make a call based on what we see and unfortunately that means a whole bunch of them uh, kind of just went, went away for now I'll leave the floor open and, and just kind of enjoy the silence for a couple of minutes here. Um, if anybody would like to chime in with thoughts. I was just going to say, um, I noticed that Stephen mentioned it um, in one of the um, comments and one of the issues recently that there's a possibility of moving away from the current bot that you currently use to probably the one that's uh, part of the GitHub platform itself, um, which might have more um, easier to use um, ways forward with this i th i think we still need the bot um i added my comments into uh, a meta issue yesterday it took me a couple of days to write that that comment but i do think it's needed going forward 
I think it's just been a an interesting experience with this. Um, wouldn't be, wouldn't be the way I'd have done it, but it it's done now. We've just got to move forward, haven't we? A definitely a learning experience for everyone. All right, it's going to take me some time, uh, Ryan, to read your comments. I'll, I'll do that later. <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate the detail write up. It is rather long for me to take time right now. Yeah. Again, I, I'll just point out like this is an evolving thing, right? Like we, we had to do something because the thousands of issues are not being looked at. And so that was not doing the right thing for those set of folks. So we're hoping that um, by having a rolling set uh, and having, you know, empowering the working groups more that we can actually surface what's really critical for both the community and the team to really focus on addressing going forward. Yeah, the intention and I, I really I, I have empathy for the responses I have seen that said, you know, I put my personal time into uncovering this issue and submitting it. And now it's been closed and I have a lot of empathy for that situation. Uh, the intention is that that issue was important and how do we provide a path where we can bring it into focus? And if it's in a pool of such a large number of issues, it's going to be difficult to sort of draw those most impacting issues out. And so this provides an avenue where we can say, OK, let's close the, the large number and then uh, for those issues that are really impacting, people can click the button that says reopen. They'll get re triaged. Maybe they were mislabeled. Maybe things have changed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we can sort of like shine a new light on those things. Um, so I don't know, we, we probably could have done a blog post or something like that to provide more thinking, but it probably uh, wouldn't have changed the end result, which is it's tough. If if you spent your time creating an issue and it's been closed, it's tough to to absorb um, that you need to go in and reopen it, especially if you have a lot of them. And so uh, going forward, that'll be something that we kind of keep in mind is uh, making sure that everything has been appropriately triaged and that our messaging in the closure is that it doesn't mean your issue wasn't important. Uh, it might just need more information and need to be reevaluated and so forth. So that was a learning experience. And let me uh, actually a reminder. I remember now one of the feedback or one of the statements someone made in uh, the meta issue. I think. So I want to be clear. Like there is no KPI that was driving this decision, right? Like no no one from Microsoft telling us, hey, you can't have issues this old or whatever. It's more like we got feedback from people. Hey, some stuff is like years old, not being looked at, and you know we don't have a big team here, so. We're trying to do the best that we can, and we really need to kind of surface what's most important for the community um, to spend time on. And this is one of the things we decided is we got to just reduce the number of issues. 700 is still a large set of issues, by the it way. Is. Yeah. Good comments. Uh, so you now have 700 plus issues, some posted on 2016 with no progress. Issues like Issues like this that were closed will be reopened by the community, but uh, I think it's similar ones with a plus one from five months ago are opened. Will they be reprocessed? Yeah, I, uh, after it's been closed, what we're thinking, and the bot may need some maintenance to get us to exactly this behavior, but we want to do this short term, meaning we, we're implementing these changes now, uh, that after it's closed, if it gets reopened, it should be re-triaged. The the uh, the idea here is that the author is basically saying, I need you to take a fresh look. And the the hope would be that they are adding more information at that point. Like, OK, you looked at it. Maybe you didn't understand what I was trying to tell you. Let me add some more information or maybe, you know, 15 people have subscribed to the issue, which tells us this is not coming from a single person. This is impacting a lot of people. That kind of stuff um, is, is the way we're thinking about interpreting the reopen and then having it go through the triage process again, if that makes sense. When that that um, that six month clock would start at the point where it has been triaged not at the point where it's been opened. And then there was a question, uh, will we be tracking how long it takes us from the point where the issue is opened to when it has been triaged? And yes, that is something that we're going to 
100%, I believe, is important um, to view as a metric uh, about, about our effectiveness at uh, reaching triage. Yeah, I'd just add on that. It's not just about the original um, commenter that says this is an issue, but it'll be anybody that's commented within that issue that can replicate it as well. Um, because the problem that you have with anything like this is somebody who's raised an issue and then has gone away because they they don't they no longer care about the project or they maybe they don't actually use uh, use it anymore. Um, so we have to be mindful that there's no point having multiple issues raised for the same thing when we've got an actual issue already for it. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, I think from my perspective, as someone who has both opened some of these issues in the past that has now been closed and is now sitting sort of on the other side of the table, having tried some of them in working groups, uh, my immediate consideration is that um, some things would get lost if you ask the original author of an issue to summarize a discussion amongst 16 people, right? So if I opened an issue in 2018 and I had good, uh, good feedback, right, good traction, a bunch of people chimed in, some people misunderstood it, I came up with some better, whatever, right? So this conversation goes on amongst a bunch of people. And then you're asking me now five years later to go back and try to sort of reinterpret what a bunch of other people misunderstood when I first said it, right? I also fear that um, in some cases, you're, you're probably right, Michael, right? We'll get more clarity, but in some cases we'll also lose something, right? There's a bit of sort mm -hmm. of a game of telephone involved in trying to recreate the original request as a new one. I see. Yeah, and also we've all slept a lot since then. So, you know, things things have definitely changed as well. The, you know, the landscape has changed quite a bit. There's probably quite a lot of these issues where we still haven't tracked that they've actually been fixed by certain changes that were either yep. caused by changes in .NET or actually changes within our repo ourselves. So we, we need to, at some point, try and map those up together so that we can go back through the change logs in future and say mm -hmm. actually a lot of these things that we've got op had open actually were fixed via the the releases that we've had in in the past hmm. that's a good point yeah uh, one last thing i think sure. justin also mentioned this in the chat uh it would be a huge pain if we have to like fight with the platform, right? So like if you go back and, and say like, oh, I have a five-year-old issue here. It was close. I want to reopen it because it's still an issue. And I think it's still relevant. So I reopen it or I try to reopen it, and then I have to like fight with a GitHub bot that wants me to either reopen new or whatever, right? Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I think in that case, I think the, the, in, yeah. the hope is that um, if it's important that the, one of the working groups that uh, should be looking at that issue, We'll put the label on it, right? Like keep open or have the discussion and decide what to do with it, um, so that individuals right. don't have to keep uh, gaming the yeah. system, if you will. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. This this is actually a really important thing, I, uh, and then we'll have to move on to the next topic um, here pretty shortly. But uh, as working group members, we're going to have to take on new courage to be willing to close issues, and that is not as easy as it sounds. Um, because we all have empathy for people who have submitted them and we, we might even recognize like this is a real issue and people are having to work around it um, but we have to have the courage to say but if we're not going to fix it we're not really doing anyone a service by just leaving it open um, so we have to be have the courage to do something about it including including just being transparent and saying we're not going to be able to work on this right now so we're going to close it and uh it, you know, if it comes back in a new form in the in the future and it includes more information, then we'll take a fresh look. That is not as easy as it sounds. Uh, so that's just something we're going to have to learn to do. OK, uh, the next one, I'm going to open the floor to Steve Lee to talk about 7.4 GA. And if there is any additional uh, need for discussion of the bot, uh, it's something that we can keep going in our monthly community call. Um, and we also could even have a dedicated discussion just on that point. Well, uh, we, we have the meta issue. Uh, we can probably just keep right. uh, using, uh, you know, as long as there's activity, that one won't close, right? Right. So, Great. Perfect. And the, the committee will probably continuously uh, review that 
issue we and see that, yeah. what comes up. We should probably convert that meta issue into a discussion because it's a discussion, yes, yeah. not really an issue. Yeah, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll go and do that now. Well, someone... Okay, that's a great point, Ryan. Right. Thank you. Very good point. Okay, yes. so Ish why don't we shift to we shift to uh, seven point four GA. So we did uh, GA meaning general availability uh, seven point four earlier this month, which means that it is our um, current LTS. Now seven point two is still under support for another year, so there's a one year overlap between uh, LTS meaning long term supported versions, and LTS versions have a three year support life cycle. So we encourage anyone who is on 7.2 to consider uh, validating 7.4 and shifting on to 7.4, you have a year to do that. Um, and then we're gonna start, I don't know when we'll have our first preview release because we do have a number of engineers out um, now already towards the end of this year. Um, so if we don't get a preview out of 7.5, which uh, would still be on .NET 8 next month, then it'll probably happen in January um, with the caveat that, you know, we again, we have a small team. So whenever we have uh, servicing releases that have security fixes, typically, like right now, that would mean that we would have a 7.2 update, a 7.3 update, and a 7.4 update. So that's three releases in a month. So the general guidance um, I've given to the team is when we do that, we're going to postpone a 7.5 preview because it's having one more, uh, four releases in a month, it just means we can't do anything else, right? Um, and I'd rather do other stuff as well. So we may skip a month if we have a, concurrent servicing releases have to go out. Um, but hopefully we'll get a 7.5 preview early because there has been a lot of changes in the uh, master branch since the first release candidate, right? Since that time we've branched off. Um, and so none of the changes that have been happening in the master branch have flowed into 7.4. Um, hopefully if you have not seen already, I do have the blog post on the PowerShell blog about some of the major um, things have to happen in some form, not all the changes. I mean, there's been a lot of fixes and small changes from the community, which we highly uh, appreciate, um, but it's just some of the major things. And not ready to talk about 7.5 yet, so look forward to my blog, hopefully late Jan or early February, when I do have a, the customary team investments blog about not, not just PowerShell, but also like OpenSSH uh, gallery and stuff like that, because um, our team does more than just PowerShell, right? So, so hopefully that'll come out very early in uh, 2024. No shortage of ideas questions. and, and yeah. passion for 7.5. <laughs> Again, 7.5 is not an LTS, so that will be a uh, what's called an STS or was it standard term support or short term? I don't know. I don't know what the .NET term is for that, but it's one year, one year support. So. Uh, for the next agenda item, I'd like to flip items three and five <laughs> uh, i'd like to invite vikram to go next if you're ready and talk about azure automation um, because i know it's quite late for you but I, I appreciate you joining the call uh and your team as well if you're still on oh yeah we are here Great. thanks Michael. Nick, nikita uh, who is the pm uh, for azure automation and then i have sanju engineering manager so they would be talking on behalf of Azure Automation. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Uh, thanks, Vikram. I will just quickly share my screen. Uh, can someone confirm if you can see? Yep, I can see it. OK, thanks. Uh, so I believe most of you would already know about Azure Automation, but just for the sake of reiterating, uh, automation provides you a serverless platform to execute your partial scripts as well as Python scripts uh, in case some of your Python users here. And uh, in case you don't want to go completely serverless and execute it on a machine of your choice that that's Arc enabled, then um, you can just install the hybrid worker extension and uh, and run a, 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 an automation job there also. So. Uh, that, that's the flexibility that automation provides. And uh, when you just compare it to in-shell execution, in, in -shell execution um, you can execute complex orchestration scenarios here where uh, there are a lot of these uh, parent-child runbooks uh, where one runbook depends on the other, um, or uh, also for state management um, where automation is being used in addition to very regular mundane scenarios that are related to you know, 
uh, weekly or monthly maintenance tasks. Um, so just quickly, I'll talk about the releases that we have done in the last few months. Uh, we recently announced support for uh, partial 7.2 runbooks um, that went um, GA, general, generally available um, this week. So I'm sure most of you would be wondering that Steve said uh, they announced partial 7.4 GA and uh, Azure Automation is still on partial 7.2, but um, just rest assured we are actively working on reducing the gap at which partial releases it, the newer versions and automation supports them uh, in their runbooks. So you would see a uh, a faster release cadence uh, in the coming months as well as uh, we have newer versions of PowerShell. Uh, also, uh, about two months back, we announced uh, uh, the automation extension for VS Code that went generally available, and uh, it it is powered with GitHub Copilot, so it just improves your, um, your script authoring experience. Um, I think most of you might have already used it. And for off Azure automation, as I already mentioned, there is the, um, you can configure any machine as a hybrid worker and run the script there. Um, since it's based on the VM extension framework, it is, it is very simple. You can just install the extension and uh, run the script there. Um, so uh, let me just pause in case anybody has any questions or comments. Okay, uh, so in case uh, you want to reach out to us anytime, please um, send us an email on askazureautomation at microsoft.com or if you have any feature requests, uh, just upvote on the ideas portal or uh, add any feature requests there or you can reach out to us also on Twitter at uh, the Twitter handle is at Azure Automation. So hoping to hear from most of you here. Thank you. Thank you for taking out time. And I put in the chat, uh, if there's anybody who is actively using Azure Automation uh, to, to execute their scripts and to manage orchestration at scale, uh, if you'd like to provide feedback or if you would just like to say hello to the team or thank you to the team, um, feel free to use the chat window or uh, I'll, I'll leave a couple of moments of silence here in case anybody would like to come off of mute. I think there is a question uh, from Levis. Nikita, do you want to take it? Will uh, there be an yeah, update to the available to the... AZ modules? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we are coming up with a new feature called runtime environment where um, we give you the complete control to configure the job execution environment. You can pick up the modules that you want at the time of execution instead of loading all the modules that are present in your automation account. Uh, so I think another two weeks from now, we should be ready to announce public preview for that feature. And uh, in there, you would be able to get the latest AZ modules. Uh, I hope that answered your question. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and that includes the AZ CLI as well, right? Like yeah. In, in the coming. Yeah, so uh, so the support for uh, Azure CLI commands in partial 7.2 runbooks is also coming along with the runtime environment feature. I think that has been an ask from uh, a lot of you. Uh, and we are almost there. Almost there to announce. I see a couple of comments in the chat, uh, just people yeah. saying they love Azure Automation uh, and they're using hybrid runbook workers and they're working very well. So that's great to hear and thank you. Yeah, thank you. Helps us uh, be assured that yes, we are going in the right direction. 
Well, thank you very much to the Azure Automation team for joining. I know uh, it's about 11.30 p.m. I think where you're at, so I appreciate you staying up late to join the call. Uh, and I added to the chat, we are we, we would like in 2024 to have at least a couple of instances of the community call that are more time zone friendly for uh, geographies around the globe. So if anybody uh, has any opinions on that or would like to provide feedback, uh, that would also be great to hear. Thank you, everyone. Great, keep the comments coming as we uh, transition over to the next topic. Uh, Mr. Sean Wheeler, would you be interested in providing us with an update on documentation? Certainly. So with the release of uh, the GA release of 7.4, of course, uh, we had to update the release notes. Um, these have all been updated with the, the latest information now. Um, and um, it no longer says preview for 7.4. Um, also recently, um, uh, I archived a bunch of content for the Windows PowerShell information and added this article. Um, I realized that we hadn't, we didn't have like one place that explained the difference between Windows PowerShell and PowerShell, and it's still a question we get. Um, from a lot of folks. The, um, in November, the oldest versions of Windows finally dropped out of support. Um, so there was a lot of content here about how to install uh, Windows PowerShell. Um, that's no longer relevant because the only supported operating systems um, there are currently, it's pre-installed. Um, if for some reason you're looking for that old content, you can go to the previous versions link here in the version picker dropdown, and, and all that content is uh, available here. Um, some other things, oh, I'll drop a bunch of links in the chat here. Um, updated the get what's new uh, module. <laughs> Uh, with the, the 7.4 release notes, uh, published that to the gallery, um, updated the SDK content. Um, so uh, with the latest 7.4 release, so that's now uh, GA content. And then um, Mikey Lombardi has done uh, a huge uplift of the uh, class and enum documentation. Um, including adding a bunch of new articles here. So um, it, it's it's almost a total rewrite of classes uh, and lots of added information uh, that was kind of spread out all over or wasn't easy to find. Um, so, uh, and it was just too much to put into one. So he's split it up here into articles about constructors, um, expand the uh, table of contents here. You can see the types of things in the article. Talks about inheritance with examples. Um, an article about class methods. And um, uh, working with uh, derived class methods and um, properties as well. So lots of uh, great content here. Um, and that's my docs update. Cool. Thank you, Sean. Uh, that we, we always appreciate the docs updates because that gives us a source of information as we're going through uh, and, and using PowerShell and automation. Um, in our daily lives. So definitely appreciate and have a lot of gratitude for the work that your team does. Uh, the next item on the agenda is an Ignite recap, and I'm not sure who <laughs> from my team uh, planned on speaking up here. Uh, Stephen, were you interested or is Sydney picking this one up? Um, yeah, like I, can, I, can, I can chat to it. Uh, just wanted to kind of give a, a brief recap um, on Ignite. 
Big night was two weeks ago. There was a lot of um, pretty awesome Microsoft announcements there. Uh, the PowerShell team had a had a great presence there. We were boothing there. We talked a lot with customers. Um, I wonder if there's even some customers that we saw at Ignite in the call today. I know I know we chatted with a few who are like, oh yeah, but I'm, I always I always come to the community call and stuff. So it was really great to to meet folks in person. Uh, we connected a lot with other Microsoft folks as well. We had two sessions um, there. The first one was. Um, Sydney did, uh, which was about all about secret management, which was a big hit. Unfortunately, that one is not recorded. Um, that was just a live demo, but we do have uh, a recording of our panel discussion, which I will share in the chat. I just can't do two things at once. Um, there we go. So we had a panel discussion with our whole team and a few other uh, members at Microsoft um, to have a discussion around kind of what's new with PowerShell, how we um, handle the open source community as well as all the new kind of releases and different sort of uh, areas that we cover. So um, definitely check out uh, the recording in case you missed it. Oh, there, yeah, there's Chris. I was like, yeah, I was wondering where Chris was. We, we Chris uh, was there at uh, Ignite and um, yeah, Sydney session was super popular. I don't know if anyone else on the PM team wants to add in uh, anything there. Um, we'll pause for a second. I'm just sorry I missed you guys. I'll just say it was really fun um, to be there and get to see all of you um, who are we were able to and we're really looking forward to seeing more of you at conferences in the new year. We're kind of in the midst of session planning um, for a number of conferences in the spring. Um, so if there's any topics that you would love to see us talk about, that's always helpful for us to know um, or if you're going to be at conferences in the coming year. Um, that we can kind of join you at. Um, that'd be great for us to know as well. But it was so much fun to get to connect with you at Ignite. Yes, 100%. Please let us know if there are conferences that are important to you and you're not seeing the PowerShell team there because uh, we, we should be thinking about that as we're going into our next year's planning. Love to see everybody at PowerShell Summit. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the obvious ones will... We'll have some representation. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, you know, making sure, right? I think right now I'll just say that there's at least a 50% chance I'll be at PSConf EU in 2024. <laughs> uh, I have to get approval. <laughs> Same. Awesome. Why don't we move on to the working group updates? Uh, this was a big thing that we wanted to <laughs> drive for the November call uh, because it highlights at the end of the year, um, you know, kind of what each working group has been doing over the course of the year. Well, obviously, we're not expecting, you know, a, a full 12 month report, uh, but just some sentiment about uh, highlights for the working group and what's important to them. Uh, I wanted to first highlight so that we are thinking about the groups. Uh, in the agenda, we've got the interactive security engine, commandlet module, and language working groups. Uh, we discussed this last night and there are two other groups. One is the quality test group and the other is DevX or Dev developer experience. Uh, neither of those have really had much activity during 2023. So it's likely like we can we can leave them sort of open, uh, but we're not going to ask for report outs and uh, whether or not those remain active working groups can kind of be up to those groups to decide. Um, and if they if they've if they've served their purpose and it's now appropriate for them to just sort of close out, then that's fine. Uh, that's an OK thing to have happen. And there may be new working groups in the future. So why don't we start off with the interactive working group? Uh, Mr. Jason Helmick, I see that you are on the call. Uh, would you like to share? Well, sure. Hey, I'm Jason and welcome to the interactive working group. So. PowerShell is this amazing product with two sides, an interactive side where you can explore, discover, learn, and troubleshoot, and then an automation scripting side where you can codify your intentions. In the interactive group, we focus on the user experiencing issues that are exclusive to interactive. So things like formatting issues, display issues, you know, problems in the console, terminal, the help system, tap completion, all that kind of stuff is where we focus on. The members, well, myself and Jim Truer, Dongbo, Patrick Meineke, uh, Aditya, 
Sean Wheeler. Sean's there not just for documentation, because but also because he's a walking encyclopedia of PowerShell. Occasionally, Stephen Booker stops by, and our community member is Ryan Yates. And I really want to give a big shout out to Ryan for his hard work and his level setting in the meetings. Um, just as a look inside of how we conduct our meetings and what we uh, like to do, most of us are working on issues um, all throughout the week. So any member can bring an issue that they've been working on or maybe that's caught their eye. But what I like to do is stack the deck at the beginning of the week. So on Monday, I uh, post a list of five issues. Now, what we've done is those have been two issues that I select from our oldest list, an issue from the newest, an issue from the most uh, commented, and one that is catches my attention. <laughs> we discuss, debate, and find uh, the next step uh, for those issues. Because of the approach that we've taken, we've been able to burn down um, a couple of years. As a matter of fact, we started with the 2016s and now we're into the 2020s. We've also been able to burn down some of the top issues. Going forward, we're gonna focus more on new and most commented issues and things that we can triage quickly. Um, what's the most challenging issue? We talked about this in the working group of maybe me bringing a couple of issues to show you what some of the most challenging were. Um, but I sat back last night and I was reviewing the list over the past year of the challenging issues that were in front of us. And I sat back and it kind of hit me. We discussed and debated each and every single one of these. Sure, some of them got resolved quicker because of consensus, but every single one of these was just as important as the last. They were all hard. They are all hard issues. And we really respect the issues and the conversations that everyone has had in them. So in, it's, it's difficult, but we, we keep focused and we keep moving forward on those issues. But in closing, I just want to thank all of the working group members for all of their dedication and hard work. But really, I'll be honest, the thanks goes out to all of you for discovering, filing, and discussing those issues that you run across to help improve the product. So from the working group of Interactive, thank you all very much for your help and support. Thank you very much, Jason. And I see that Sydney Smith has started her camera. Uh, that takes us to the next working group focused on security. Cool, yeah. So I am in the security working group alongside Travis and Anam. And we meet on Mondays during PowerShell Community Day. Um, and sort of what we do in our um, working group is we get tagged in any sort of issue that may have security implications. And so as a team, we review whether or not this issue may have security implications, what those might be, and sort of analyze any sort of changes to PowerShell um, from a security perspective and provide our guidance there. Um, and then alongside that, we sort of um, help drive any sort of patch releases that might happen through PowerShell. So that's kind of what our working group is up to. Um, I'll keep it pretty short there and, and pass it on. Cool. Thank you, Sydney. The next one, we've got the engine working group, and I believe Mateus is going to help us out <coughs> with information there. Oh, you're still on mute. Thank you, Michael. That's right. Uh, I am one of two uh, community members of the uh, engine work group. Uh, we probably have the most convoluted scope of all the working groups because what we're interested in is all the complexities uh, inside system management or automation. So sort of the core API of PowerShell. Uh, there's a lot of dragons in there. Uh, uh, PowerShell as a product has been around for a long time. And uh, as a working group, I think we probably try to, and we maybe also come, come across as a little conservative somewhere, uh, uh, sometimes because we try to sort of uh, keep PowerShell PowerShell basically. Uh, so I saw a bunch of people in the chat already uh, complaining that we tend to reject a lot of the uh, suggestions or feature requests that come in. And often it's because we sort of have a, uh, a philosophical uh, difference of understanding in what the requester asks us. But uh, usually what we do is uh, we'll get um, we'll get two types of issues in uh, either box or uh, sort of breaking changes or suggested features that would uh, count as, as breaking changes. And then we sort of try to work through them and try to figure out sort of what are the implications of these things, uh, where both in terms of performance, fragmentation of the API itself, uh, are we breaking anything or are we sort of going too far away from what PowerShell is at, at its core? Um, 
in every meeting we try to sort of cut a balance between uh, triaging um, uh, pull requests uh, as we've been doing for the last year uh, to try to sort of uh, um, keep that going, right? Some community members have had this experience that you open a pull request with a complicated change or a change sort of deep deep down into the API, and then nothing happens because no one is reviewing it or nobody's asking the questions that would sort of drive you forward in, uh, in closing the PR. And so we try to pick up some of these sort of complicated uh, low level engine PRs and try to sort of move them forward by giving feedback or uh, giving recommendations to, uh, to refactoring changes. Uh, other than that, we also try, uh, of course, new feature requests uh, and, uh, and bugs. The way we work, uh, I should probably mention, we have uh, six active members in the working group, uh, two community uh, members, myself and Keith Hill, and then uh, four people from Microsoft, uh, Rain, Patrick, uh, Jim, and Dongbo from the PowerShell team. And so we meet every two weeks uh, with a rotating meeting chair. So for the last two meetings, uh, I've had the, uh, the privilege of picking out which issues um, uh, we had to review. Uh, to one of the points earlier, uh, Steve, closing, closing all of these issues from the past has actually helped us in prioritizing our work a lot because uh, previously we'd have to look through maybe 1200 issues that were all sort of relevant for the work we do. Some of them five years old, some of them five weeks, uh, weeks old. And so in order to try to prioritize that based on feedback and so on, um, sort of having this cleanup has been, um, ha has been massively helpful in, uh, in picking up some of the slack in the engine working group. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, I will cover the next one, which if I find the window, uh, would be commandlets and modules. Um, so this is a, actually a really awesome conversation. Uh, we meet, uh, I believe, weekly. It seems like weekly. It might be every other week. Uh, and just go through issues and PRs that have been submitted on anything related to a commandlet uh, or any of the modules that are built in or uh, in, in, that ship with PowerShell or reg are regularly used with PowerShell. Uh, a lot of really deep technical conversation around changes to modules um things that were broken unintentionally through change that need to be revisited uh, and that kind of thing but you can imagine uh, debating exactly how the code under the hood works uh for anything as, as common as like copy item uh, that you're using every day or get child item uh and that kind of or, you know, start process and things like that um and really interesting to see how some of these tools uh, changed as they went from PowerShell 5.1 uh, through PowerShell 6 and, and PowerShell 7 and where they're going in the future. Uh, I wanted to say thank you for everyone who joins that call from outside of Microsoft, uh, especially Mr. Dr. DNS, um, uh, Thomas Lee, thank you uh, for, for joining our calls. Uh, certainly Jeff Hicks, uh, for joining and providing feedback. And then Dr. Tobias Weltner, thank you very much for joining the calls and providing feedback as well. Uh, Steve Lee any, or, or Jim Schuer, thank you for your help on the call as well. But anybody that, uh, uh, or any, anything else that you wanted to mention in regards to the commandlet or module working group? Uh, I guess one thing I'll mention is like um, a lot of issues fall under this area as well. I mean, engine gets a lot as well. Um, and and you know one of the things that we always think about is like does it really need to be something in PowerShell 7 itself, or does it make sense to do it on a gallery and get feedback that way? And then we can decide whether or not there's sufficient usage that we need to revisit the discussion of being it being part of the core package, right? Um, so I think for anyone opening a new issue, especially for a new command, uh, think about that first. It's like really, can it be on the gallery? We really want to promote that as a way to uh, get things and also decouple. Uh, updates of those modules versus PowerShell itself. So, but again, uh, I also appreciate uh, you know the community members of that working group as well as the community members of other working groups. Outstanding. Uh, the last one is the working group focused on language, and uh, we've got Jim Schuer. I wasn't sure if if Jim wanted to talk about language or if Steve, if you wanted to take that one as well. It's up to you. Uh, up to Jim. <laughs> Have Jim talk about because I'm actually not in that group. Oh, got it. So the language group is the smallest working group. We're really trying to make sure that the PowerShell language is and the syntactical elements are <coughs> are uh, looked after very carefully. And in fact, we have decided uh, as a as a working group to follow 
uh, or to try to follow the C sharp model for language enhancements and changes. Not not bugs, but just enhancements. So there's a PR out uh, currently to change our governance to uh, discuss uh, how, what that process should be. Uh, and we've got some commentary in it. Uh, there is, um, uh, a, and we have been meeting uh, somewhat regularly, but uh, uh, but we have determined that 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 this working group should probably behave a little bit differently differently than some of the other working groups, which is why we've come up with this PR to change our governance uh, for our process. Uh, yeah, there is a link. Uh, let me see. I'll I'll track it down and put it in put it in uh, in the chat. It's very. I cribbed it almost well. I didn't in, crib it entirely from the C sharp language, but I did. Uh, I did uh, use that as our model since we're so tightly related to C sharp, and in fact, in some cases, you know, some of C sharp C sharp syntax is our. Uh, uh, Elements of C sharp syntax are found in PowerShell, uh, maybe twisted just a tiny bit to match the interactive the, or the the shell aspects of it. But yeah, I'll put the uh, I'll find the link and post that in this chat. Awesome. That yeah, there it is. Patrick did it. Thank you so much, <laughs> Patrick. Very good. And then our last area is the committee in general. And uh, Steve, if you're interested, you can. Take that yeah. one on and I'll, I'll uh, supplement or anybody from the committee can supplement as needed. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll cover this briefly and request, I just checked it. And, and it looks like um, the membership list on the repo is out of completely out of date. Um, I think the regular participating members, participating members is Jim, um, Michael, myself, uh, Damien, Caro from uh, Azure Pasha, Azure CLI side. Uh, we have a few folks who uh, are not formally out of the committee although they haven't, uh, since leaving Microsoft, hasn't been as active. Um, so I think we need to probably update that and we may yeah. have to revisit um, the discussion. We started a long time back of adding someone from the community to the committee, but in general, I mean, the committee these days doesn't have as much work as we used to now that we have the working groups taking care of a lot of the load. And only when something isn't resolved at that point or, uh, or if someone in community doesn't agree with that decision, it gets appealed up to the committee. Um, so some of the stuff that we talk about more now is stuff like the bot, right? So how do we tackle some higher level um, problems? So if you guys hated the, the auto closure, you can blame the committee for that discussion and decision. Um, but these are the kind of things that we talk about. It's like, all right, what are some long-term strategies? Where do we want to go with this product? Uh, with the not just the uh, engineering side, but also like you know the community and stuff like that. So um, these are the type of discussions we have. Michael, anything you want to add? No, I don't think so. Um, yeah, the, the committee is, in my opinion, serving the purpose of uh, more like strategic decision making. And uh, unless there's an escalation, fewer of the uh, like which which issues to take on, which PRs to take on, things like that, it's more high level than that. Um, but yeah, it would be great to have uh, some additional representation from outside of Microsoft um, at some point in the future. So, yeah, I guess one thing I'll just add because this came up a few months ago is like any reports of abuse gets reviewed by the committee, mm -hmm. and we try to yeah. take that on very timely, uh, adhering to the code of conduct. So, and and I'll just say in general, I think people are pretty good on the repo. Yeah. Yeah. All right, that keeps us right on schedule. And the last item on the agenda is community demos. I think a couple of people had mentioned they might be interested. Um, so I will leave the floor open. And if anybody's interested in a community demo, then uh, we'll help you share your screen and you can take the floor. Justin. I can be yeah. quick. Justin, if you want to go quick, first, James? you're welcome to no, go You can first. go first, James. That's fine. All right. Well, um. Let's be quick then. Let me. Let's see. Is my screen showing up in camera yet? No, no not I yet. To, I need to find you. There you are. Okay. 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 You should be able to present now. All right. So I'm going to start sharing. And.
Let me know if everybody can see it. It's working. Cool. Um, so this is demonstrating uh, upcoming build of TypeScript. I will be also talking about this, the Pacific PowerShell user group in a couple of weeks. And a very exciting feature. Uh, there was a language overhaul in terms of how PowerShell or TypeScript works with other languages. And one of the best side effects of this is inline interpretation. So normally, if you ran this in PowerShell, you would actually get this file open for you. But no, it's actually running. It's running this file. And I can get its results back as a variable. And I can do the same thing for JavaScript too. How is this working? Well, there's a pre-command lookup. This becomes an alias to invoke interpreter. Invoke interpreter has a mapping of which interpreters exist for which languages. In this case, it's literally just calling Python or JavaScript or Node.exe for each of the different file types. But it's nice, open-ended and extensible, and now we can actually seamlessly work with any other language inside of PowerShell. So I'm really excited about this one. There's a lot of other really fun stuff coming in the next build, but this one in particular is, um, how do you just want to say it? Really awesome sauce. So that's my quick demo. Uh, hope it was quick enough. You want to see more? Come by in a couple weeks. Fun, not fun, interesting. Uh, Michael, you're getting, I you're getting you're comments in the chat, James. Uh, Justin, are you ready? Since we're getting close to out of time here. <laughs> yeah, I can uh, do a couple here real quick. So let me just share here. So I just have two kind of quick things I want to show. Um, one is a little uh, uh, thing I made called PowerServe. So this is made for some very specific situations where you have like a monitoring program or something that needs to call PowerShell all the time, like from the command line. Like it doesn't have any way to integrate PowerShell or doing that kind of thing. Um, monitoring programs are notorious for this. Like they have like a custom script that they need to run like once a minute or whatever. And so they're calling up PowerShell to like run it and then close it down. So team's done a good job of really making like PowerShell work pretty quick on the startup and shutdown, but there's still a lot of overhead that happens there. So for instance, in this example, if I um, bring up my uh, task manager here real quick, if I um, go ahead and try to do this, like the, run this one script 100 times just to say hello and run it in parallel 30 times, you know, my, my computer starts going nuts with the terminal 100 percent, you know, loading all of this memory for all these different PowerShell instances to run it. So I'm just going to cancel that, which may take a second. And that may have impacted the video. Sorry if it did. So what PowerServe does is, is PowerServe is a um, an AOT ahead uh, compiled client that uses the uh, that utilizes the AOT function in the newer .NET versions to make a really fast, powerful, kind of like how like in like Go and such, you can compile these really nice, small, fast executables. We can do that in .NET now with .NET 8. And so what it does is that it ends up spinning up a PowerShell instance in the background and then uses a very simple sort of client server um, protocol to it, where it basically just sends commands to the server. The server executes the script in a run space and then returns it back via JSON. That all just happens in a PowerShell process, but because it's not standing up whole PowerShell processes every time and it's using run spaces within a single process, it's actually able to run much faster. So that same command, which took up all that memory and got stuck, to run the same thing there it took only 600 milliseconds to get those results and you saw there was almost no cpu usage because it's able to go in use those run spaces and resolve so we've done this with some tests for some of our internal monitoring where we, we use a lot of custom scripts and it um it's reduced like our, our the workload on our servers just from the powershell overhead of starting up powershell and stopping it for these hundreds of scripts that have to go out and check information on all these systems it's reduced those workloads by like uh, you know like 80 percent on the memory usage and like 50 percent on the cpu usage and so it's um a really handy little thing there's um on my github is for power client for that and then one other thing that i have just here on the other side is um, feedback providers are a new feature in PowerShell 7.4. And I made um, two different feedback providers recently. I made one for um, um, 
whenever you run certain um, uh, graph commands, it can detect whether you're whether it needs like the advanced syntax in terms of like the eventual consistency and such and give you feedback on that. And I also made a script feedback provider that lets you write um, feedback providers just as PowerShell scripts. So basically, once you install this module, you just run a register and provide the parameter. And then there's some simplified syntax where this one just simply says if the last error if it had a recommended action, because there's this property that a lot of people don't know about in error details about a recommended action, then go ahead and report that a <laughs> recommended action is needed. And so I'm sorry, this is probably really small. Um, so when you go to write an error, uh, if, if an error happens, if you have this feedback provider installed, um, oh, no, I got a whole mess going here. Uh, if you have that feedback provider installed, you can, um, if you have an error that has a recommended action, now the feedback provider will report it. So this was just an easier way. Mostly usually the default setup is to have to write feedback providers in C sharp. This is a way that you can actually write them just in pure PowerShell by using the script provider module. And you can even see them registered uh, with the get script feedback provider module and then unregister them as needed rather than having to do it. Oops, uh, rather than having to need to do it with the um, the C sharp and the module load unload. So just a few little things that I've been working on that are fun little things. And so just quick demo, thanks. Fantastic. That is really, really useful too. I'm that is sure. really great. And sorry, if it wasn't super clear, here's that feedback action because the this git mg user supplies that recommended action in part of it. So here's an example of it working with like a real command book. So um, this is an experimental feature in 7.4. You have to enable it, um, but all you have to do is install the script feedback provider module, which I haven't published to the gallery yet, but I will soon. And then you can write your own feedback providers. I basically wanted this to work a lot like how like argument completers and stuff already work, where you can write them in PowerShell um, and not have to um, delve into the C sharp. So it turned out not to be too difficult to do. I just basically register a feedback provider for you that ends up calling those script blocks for you in an isolated run space. Sorry, yeah. I'm running over again. Oh, it's okay. Uh, it does give me one quick add on bonus point. I'm also going to be adding Git. Uh, Submodule and uh, sparse checkout features to TypeScript v next. So you should be able to actually take these things that Justin's demonstrating and just include them from his repos into projects and build your own. But fantastic work, can't wait to leverage it. Perfect. I think we're going to finish right on time <laughs> according to our schedule. Just, uh, just anybody? Yeah, Ryan, go ahead. One last one. I put in awesome. a discussion for a uh, December call because obviously we've we've said this previously that uh, it's nice to have another call at the end of the year that isn't uh, focused by the team and is led by the community. I've got a discussion that I've put in December 14th as a as a date. Um, my thinking about that is because it's not too early in the month, it's not too late in the month, and it doesn't give uh, a need for people in the team to to join if they don't, you know, if they don't want to, if they're on holiday or visiting family and, and getting ready for for um, the end of the year shutdown. I'm going to put in a link for that call probably around this sort of time as well. If anybody wants to join, and I'll add that to the discussion, which I'll just add the link into. Um, the chat now. My end about works. <laughs> awesome. Ryan? Yeah, for the December call, just to echo what Ryan was saying, uh, we would love to have the community host a December call. And uh, that can take shape and form however the community decides but it would give us a chance to kind of step back and let the community drive for a month um and, and you know potentially bring up uh topics and agenda items we never would have considered that are of high value so everyone is fascinated uh myself included with the demos <laughs> okay i think that's it for today uh, is there anything to add from anyone think i know it's been a really awesome 2023 um a lot has happened this year, and so thank you everyone who has contributed and participated. Uh, we really have a lot of gratitude for the community. Anything anybody else would like to add before we wrap up? Uh, Hi, it's Missy. Uh, go ahead. Missy. 
I just want to say thank you to the PowerShell community for all of your extremely high quality submissions for the PowerShell Summit. Um, our evaluators are working very hard to read all of the submissions and determine uh, which sessions will get selected. And we have a very like tough set of choices. So um, December 15th is our target to have um, speakers um, not speakers e emails out. So that's all I have. <laughs> that's awesome. I can't Here's wait. Uh, I was going to say a little light plug uh, Pacific PowerShell user group. We will have another meeting uh, this December 8th. I'll be posting the link soon and you can come by and learn more about, you know, dynamic interpreting of other languages in PowerShell. Thanks. Thank you. And if anybody else has community events coming up, uh, I would say let's drop them into the chat channel if you'd like to get some more attention to them or invite people who might be on the call or listening to the recording, watching the recording, <laughs> who, who are looking for a, a local event they can attend. Um, that is definitely something we want to do more of in 2024. I think uh, the past three years were tough for local events, so that's something we are passionate about bringing back. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the UK groups at some point will return in 2024. And unfortunately, things for me are a little bit up in the air at the moment. So I'm planning to try and bring them back. But this this is a. It's a work in progress, shall I say. Um, if, so if you follow follow me on Twitter or or the or the get PSUG UK Twitter account, that'll be where I, I post things or, or my blog. Um, and yeah, it's a it's a to be to be determined, should we say? Fair, very fair, no problem. And thank you for your work on that, Ryan. Great, well, we can wrap it up. Thank you everybody for joining. And uh, I look forward to attending the community call in more of a read-only fashion <laughs> in December and uh, talking to you all again in January.